Sam Chavana Notimum, Devim Sarasutim Via Sam Tito Jayo Diriat, Nashta Prayashu, Badre Su, Nitum Bagata Seva, Bagati Utamashuki, Bakti Babati Nashtiki, Nigamal Kapado to Garitam Param, Shukamakana Mita Dravi Samitam, Pibata, Bagatam Rasha Mairayo Mahora Hor, Sibu Yvakaham, Vishnu Sala Mopanga, Dalekishara, Karunasta, Vishamisha Paranako, to know Ditaham. Divyadvindyanayana-kapadhu-madashimaradhanagarashimasanastoshisiradishudukovinapraslevihisemmanushmanami Yogam Patimi and the Shas, Galapate, Mate, Guru, Shaki, Persano, Santu, Santu, Guruman. Oh, my God, Timur and the Shang and Agana, Sanaka, Chaksur, and Miditum Yanitash, my ease, you get away in Mahum. See it at Animano Vistam, Sapitum Yanaputre, Sayam, the Parker of Mayam Dadati, Sapar and Tikum. The Mao Vishnu, Paraya Krishna, Pastai, Bhutare, Shimari Bhakti, but out to Shami, to know when the are Sati Devi or any Pacharini, near which has the Sunnibadi Prescata days are done. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Kiradhar Shiva Sari Gaur Bhaktivindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Good morning Govinda Dave. Good morning Branton. Here with me on the Zoom call is Rob. Did Rob, how are you feeling? Are you okay? Uh, I'm finally starting to feel like I'm on the up and up. Um, I've just got a lingering cough that's kind of gnarly sometimes, but other than that, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good finally. It was just a seasonal flu. It wasn't COVID or anything. No, I, I actually think it was an ear infection because that's what my son had, and I was I was spending a lot of time holding him and comforting him while he had that. So a lot of sleep deprivation. I just think I uh, my immunity's got down, and I caught it from him. Cool. Well, I'm glad you're feeling a little better. Um, Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, as Govinda Dave knows, and as Brent knows very well, and as Rakesh, who's just joined us, knows, we had a, kind of a watershed event on Saturday. Since COVID started, our indoor events have understandably plummeted in attendance. <clears throat> when we first opened the Salt Lake City Temple in 2019, the first Janmashtami had the biggest crowd I've ever seen of Indians and Westerners at any and any look, any gathering at all, it's thousands and thousands of people. And then COVID came and the next John Mastami from, I don't know, countless people. We went, probably had 150 people the whole time. So Diwali also is a very well attended event normally and it plummeted. Um, and we had a couple of outdoor events this fall, Festival of Colors, summer and fall, June in Salt Lake City and September in Spanish Fork. Um, an outdoor event is not so much of a concern for COVID. But last Saturday we had Diwali and uh, it was a very, very substantial crowd. I think Govinda Dave would agree with me. Anyone who was there, Temple Room was packed, you know, hundreds of people, six, seven hundred people is my estimate. Um, wonderful program. So I think we're back. I think I think in terms of you know public gatherings, we're we're back after such a long hiatus and it, it feels good it feels good to organize an event um the attendance of which not only meets but exceeds your expectations the weeks preceding um i would go up to salt lake city on the weekends and go a little early save time for putting up posters at coffee shops and indian grocery stores and we did a little social media campaign and obviously we hit a we hit a sympathetic chord amongst the community because people showed up in, in uh, en masse. <clears throat> Started out with an arti at six o'clock, then uh, Govinda Dev led the Dhammadarashtakam prayers. Uh, Ishan led a kirtan while everyone circling him led a Govardhan hill, <clears throat> after which they offered uh, lamps to Radha Govinda and Srinathji and made their wish 
then we had a nice, wonderful dance um, presentation by Suda Kargi. Um, really, really well done. Her, her students did a great job. Everybody was entranced. After that, we had a procession. We went around the temple on, with Sita Rao on a palanquin and uh, ended up behind the auditorium where the uh, Vortex uh, Fireworks Company uh, gave a really good, really good fireworks display, even though cost of fireworks along with everything else is skyrocketed, you might say, during the pandemic. Um, they kept their costs down to their normal a minimal $500 and put on a short but very, very explosive <laughs> show for the crowd. After that, we filled it into the auditorium and had uh, Garba. We had the folk dancing. Um, that was incredibly popular. If you go to our Facebook page, Hare Krishna Temple of Salt Lake City or Churu, Utah, you can see just the beginning of the Garba. It picked up in tempo and it picked up intensity as the evening went on. We went for about 45 minutes. It was interesting because I had 12 and a half miles on my Fitbit at the end of the day, and most of it accounted for the time going round and around and around and around in the in the garba. After 45 minutes, I don't know about others, and I was exhausted. But some of those ladies, they didn't want us to stop. You know, if you go to just a garba program, not a garba program kind of couched in a lot of other things, it'll it'll go till midnight easily. So a lot of the ladies were just getting warmed up. <laughs> I said, I, I'd love to go longer, but I have to get back to Spanish work, and I'd like to get to bed before midnight. <laughs> so a watershed landmark event, I think you'll all agree with me, we're back with big crowds. Uh, success by the previous pre-COVID standards has revisited us, and we look forward to collaborating and creating more and more gatherings in the future. And one of the best parts of the event was working with uh, uh, Govinda Dave, as well as Mukunda by Bobby, uh, <clears throat> Ras Vilas, <clears throat> Chaitanya, uh, Sarup. Um, Paki's in India right now, so she wasn't part of the uh, organization, Govinda Bhakti. It's a great, great little core group that we had that put together a very smooth running festival. And I have to say, the schedule that we published, I kept to it to the minute. I kept it to the minute. In fact, uh, the garb was scheduled to start at 8.30, but started a little early at 8.15, and ended at 9 o'clock. So we're quite chuffed here in Salt Lake City. Um, we never really closed during COVID. We did wear a mask and we social distanced, but we never really closed. However, we did experience the attrition of a number of regulars, and our numbers had dwindled in practically every area. And many people still have not yet come back being uh, extremely, exceedingly cautious. And we don't, um, I mean, that's fine. Um, if, uh, but, at, but at the same time, um, we had a gratifyingly large number of Westerners as well as new people come on uh, Saturday night. So in the, fame, in the words of a famous screen personality, we're back. And we're back to this verse here today. Fifth chapter, first canto of Bhagavatam, 26th verse, part four. Tatan Baham Krishna Katha Pragaya Tamanugarena Shivatam Nasharya Menu Patam Vrishin Raha Priyashivashya Skali Tamatir Mama. Narimuni says, O Vyasadev, in that association by the mercy of those great Vedantists, I could hear them describe, and here is the operative word here. The attractive activities of Lord Krishna, and thus listening attentively, my taste for the hearing of the personality of God had increased at every step. So we're talking about hearing, we're talking about listening, not just sound going in one ear and out the other, but listening actively, listening empathetically, listening attentively in such a way that what you're hearing has relevance to you, to what you know, to what brought you to where you are at present and what there is in that verse that can help you get to the next level. And if you hear actively, uh, then you will quickly develop a taste for hearing more and more. Your taste will increase at every step, just like it did for Narada Muni. But if you don't hear attentively, if you don't hear actively, then you'll lose your momentum. You'll slow and slow and slow and slow, and eventually your spiritual progress will come to a full stop. The good news is, 
Tata Tamburi Samiro Labate Yatato Chataro Samsiro Kurunanda Sham. That whatever progress you ever make, that is a permanent asset in your bank. So whenever you resume the process of devotional service, you'll begin from where you left off. But it is a fact that many of those who started, who exploded out of the starting blocks, um, failed to keep up that momentum and they didn't finish their race. They sat, soaked, and soured. Um, it's an unfortunate circumstance, but at the same time, um, whatever you do in devotional service, neha brikama nasasi pratyabhaya shwapa bhisha trayate mahatobhaya. At least those who made some progress in hearing in this life will get the chance to come back in a family of wealthy or stratocratic people or devotees. Uh, actually, they're one and the same. Uh, had you taken birth in India 50 or 60 or 70 or 100 years ago, the aristocratic, wealthy, well-to-do people were all pretty much universally devotees of the Lord. And you begin from where you left off. But the best course of action is don't lose your enthusiasm. Listen attentively. Chant quality rounds. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And pay attention to one other feature, which we're going to talk about today. Previous three sessions, we talked about what to hear, where it comes from, how to hear. Now, we're going to talk about who to hear from. In the secular world, the only main considerations are who, what is the content and who is the listener? Who is the audience and what is the content? It's a question of matching the subject matter with the interests uh, and the abilities and proclivities of the listener. That's secular listening. But in, in spiritual listening, there's, there's not only the, the content and there's not only the audience, but we take into consideration the who, the speaker. It's a very assertive verse from the Padma Puranam. A Vaishnava Mukho Giram. Vaishnava, that's what we are, we're devotees. A Vaishnava term comes from Vishnu, and Nava means to follow. So Vaishnavas are followers of Vishnu. Um, and we observe what we call the Sampradaya, the Sibli, the session where we receive knowledge from speaker to disciple down through the generations. And each link in that spiritual chain preserves the content of the spiritual subject matter without changing it, without editing it, uh, without um, altering it in any way. There's a, there's a conscientiousness, there's a tremendous diligence on the part of the bona fide spiritual masters to pass down what they've received intact. As it was given to them, they give it to others. Prabhupada said, I came to the Western world and everyone says, I'm a miracle worker. But my mo only miracle is that I deliver the message intact. What I got from my spiritual master, I passed it on intact to my disciples. Prabhupada compared himself to a postman. Postman doesn't open the letter and edit it. He doesn't take out some words, add some other words. <clears throat> he simply delivers the letter um, as it was given to him. So the bona fide spiritual master is one who has heard attentively from his previous acharya, and he passes down that knowledge with fidelity. If you hear from such a person, you're getting the full potency of the Sampradaya. You're in the presence of Krishna's representative, which is non different than being in Krishna's presence. However, if you don't take, take care, not only the content, and not only you may be qualified, but if you're not hearing from a Vaishnava coming online with the session, then not only would that subject matter not benefit you, but it may even be dangerous. Avaishnava <clears throat> Mukhogyana says the words coming from the mouth of someone who's a non Vaishnava, concoctive, speculative. Mukhogyana is, is sometimes used to mean vomit. Means, Mukho means coming from the mouth, but what's coming from the mouth is refuse, it's unwanted stuff. So even even the great greatest content to the greatest listener, if it's not coming from a realized soul, coming in the line of a civic session, it is actually referred to as vomit. And the example goes on, Sarpo, the name means exactly what it sounds like. Sarpo means snake. Milk 
is very nourishing. It's good food. It's food for the brain. But when it's touched by the lips of a serpent, that milk has poisonous effect. But even good and accurate transcendental knowledge, scriptural knowledge, coming from an untrustworthy source, filtered through someone who is not a devotee, not a practitioner, that knowledge can be um, dangerous. It can be actually dangerous, I think. Take some of the things that we have nowadays, like um, the military, we need defense, we need chatras, uh, we need to protect ourselves against aggressors. And yet some of the things the military are up to are in the hands of ill-intentioned people. They can be very dangerous. They can be very intrusive. They can. We have the military to protect us from the invasions, uh, the incursions of foreign interests. And yet there are areas in which the military uh, suppresses us and takes away our privacy and curtails our individuality more than any outside force could possibly do. So the the technology is okay, but you have to be careful it doesn't fall into the hands of the wrong people. Internet, same thing. Same thing with internet. Good content in the hands of wrong people. How many times have we seen that come to disastrous results? Now, on the other hand, even if there's a deficiency in the content, but the source is good, it's helpful. In the Bhagavatam, second canto, Sukadeva Goswami says, Tadbhag vishargo jarataga viparo yashmin patisho namami antasha srinvadhi gyaji grinati sarabaha. When Prabhupada came to the West, he had copies of the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in three volumes. The binding was crude, the cover was not the most sophisticated art. The paper was not the highest quality paper. Um, it wasn't produced by uh, a big, like random, ran, uh, what are some of the random house, um, some of the big publishing companies from New York City. It was produced on a shoestring budget in Delhi by some friends of Prabhupada who were doing him a favor. And uh, you know, you could, you could look at some of the grammar and some of the wording and see mistakes. Um, and yet, it is said that even though imperfectly composed, such literature, the, the, when it's delivered by the bona fide spiritual master, it has the capability of producing a revolution in the misguided minds of people in general. And that Srimad Bhagavatam, from that one trunk, that battered trunk that Prabhupada brought with him to America, that Srimad Bhagavatam sat, although you could look and you could criticize it in so many ways from the point of view of a professional printer. Those humble, modestly produced books uh, have created a revolution in the lives of millions and millions of people all over the world. Another more simple, closer home example, say a teacher sits down with a kindergarten or first grade teacher in the math class and says, you can only subtract a smaller number from a bigger number. And those of you who have taken calculus, you know that that's not true. You can actually subtract a bigger number from a smaller number. But it wouldn't be helpful for the teacher to tell that to the student. The teacher is giving the student a half-truth. The teacher, if you want to be really scrutinizing about it, the teacher is telling the student a falsehood. But it is the right thing that the student needs to hear at that point in time. Because the teacher has the best interest of the student in mind, so the teacher filters through all the various ways they could present an essential principle of mathematics, and they give to the student what they feel is the best thing for them at that time, at that place, and at that circumstances. Oftentimes in our world of the internet, Facebook, we see posts, we see comments, we don't know what the source of that is. We're hearing but we, we don't know who the source of it is. If you accept it uncritically, you're setting yourself up to be cheated and misdirected. You have to work extra hard, especially in this day and age, to learn who it is that's speaking. You know. For instance, the Bhagavad Gita, there are thousands and thousands of translations of the Bhagavad Gita. 
and they're very good translations. Prabhupada said that the Sanskrit is pretty tight. You cannot go too far astray when you're translating the Sanskrit. Krishna is speaking to Arjuna in a very elementary way. Srimad Bhagavatam has much more flowery verses embellished with poetry and alliteration. But the Bhagavad Gita is very simple. It's the ABCD of spiritual life. It's like, here is Jack, here is Jane, see Jack and Jane, here is Jack and Jane with their dog, see Jack and Jane running with their dog. Very simple. Short verses, simple verses, very straightforward. It's difficult to go wrong in the translation. But the commentaries, the purports of the non-devotees, the academicists, the scholars, the politicians, are totally misleading. So the, con the content is good. The people who are presenting it are obviously intelligent people. But because they don't honor Krishna, the speaker of the Gita, the goal of the Gita, the whole purpose that Krishna spoke the Gita was to awaken bhakti, loving devotional service in the heart of the listener. But because the vast majority, all Gita is pretty much except for Bhagavad Gita as it is, ignore the source. Ignoring the source. It's just cutting and pasting. For instance, Prabhupada said so many things. Now you have to look at what Prabhupada said and to whom he said it and when he said it. You take it out of context, it could be totally misleading. Did Prabhupada say it as a one-off thing? Is it something he repeated over and over and over and he wanted his disciples to get down deep in his spirit? Was it a conversation? Was it a morning walk? Was it a Sunday feast lecture for the people in general? Was it just spoken to one person sitting on an airplane trip? And we always look for the contents, the person and the context, the context in which it was spoken to have a truly good and full understanding of the sound vibration. <clears throat> if you've read Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna book, and you're like me, kind of slow down when you get to the whole chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter of prayers. It's one prayer after another, after another, after another prayer, after another, after another prayer. Prayer by Lord Brahma, prayer like Lord Shiva, prayer by the demigods, prayer by Lakshmi, prayer by Varuna, prayer by Kubera. The prayers, you have to, You sometimes you feel as a neophyte devotee, you're just slogging through the prayers. The prayers can be hard. <laughs> you want to get to the storyline. You want to get back to where something's happening. There's a war, there's a, there's a clash, there's, a, there's friction, there's a palace conspiracy, there's a love affair, there's a curse being levied at somebody. Uh, that's easy to read. We look forward to that. And yet, if you peruse the commentaries of the Charyas, like Sridhar Swami, for instance, they are most ecstatic in commenting on the prayers. The prayers, for instance, in the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam by the personified Vedas go on and on and on and on and on. But if you read the commentaries of Sridhar Swami, he is most ecstatic by going through those prayers. Now, how you get the most out of the prayers, following the footsteps of the great Acharyas, is you have to consider who is praying here, what are the circumstances under which they're praying, what's brought them to this point, what I can learn from this prayer, how does this prayer interface with other prayers that I've heard of? How does it even contradict something that I've heard somewhere else? And how do I resolve and reconcile that contradiction? You look for the person in the message. You don't just take the sound vibration, but you take the person from whom the sound vibration is coming and you try to understand the context. This is what we need to do as personals. This is what we need to do as Vaishnavas. Personal means taking into consideration who is speaking and try to glean from them, to capture from them the feeling of love, which is overflowing their heart. It's not about a religion, we often say, but it's about a relationship. And in order to come to that point, you have to consider not just what you're hearing, not just how you're hearing, not just why you're hearing, but you have to consider finally who you're hearing from. 
If you look at the conversations in Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya, Charnarita, you can't read them for long without noticing something that happens over and over and over and over again. <clears throat> and that is, when a listener like Marj Parikit um, asks a question, he praises the speaker. Because if you're, if, you're, if you're not respectful, if you don't feel that the speaker has something extraordinary and unique to impart to you, not only through their words, but through their character, then why are you sitting, wasting your time listening to that speaker in the first place? If the speaker is worthy, then before asking the question, you praise the speaker. After all, you're spending the valuable time of your human form of life in the presence of that speaker posing your questions. So it has to be a worthy speaker. Our life is too short. Our time is too valuable. Our mission is too important to waste our time hearing from unqualified speakers. And when we praise the speaker, it demonstrates also that we're poised to actively listen to the answer to our question. It doesn't have to be a soft question. It can be a hard question. We can say, well, you said this and you appear to be contradicting yourself here. You appear to be repeating yourself here. Or if you say this now, what about this that you said previously? It doesn't have to be a soft, groveling, syncopatic question. But it has to recognize that whatever the speaker says, he's worthy and that you're going to actively listening to us. And when you praise the speaker, rather than just throw out some challenging, uh, insulting, condescending question, the result will be that, and then the speaker, in his turn, he'll praise the questioner. Even if it's a hard question, or even if there is that kind of inkling of disrespect from the questioner to the speaker, the speaker will always say, well, that's a very good question, or I'm glad you asked that. And that will have the result of defusing the speaker. When you validate the speaker and recognize that they've made a contribution, that will cause them to listen better. And by taking the time to repeat their question and say one or two complimentary words about them, that will give you the time to put together, to compose in your mind, a better answer. So what you did by the listener praising the speaker, or even if the listener doesn't praise the speaker, by the speaker praising the listener, you just create a dynamic of empathy between the speaker and the listener. When the listener praises the speaker as being worthy of his time, and when the speaker praises the listener, then you create a, a very, very empathetic dynamic. A couple of examples. <clears throat> Patanjali is generally considered the Acharya, the groundbreaker, the pioneer of yoga. And in many yoga classes, there are a few, Sarvabhadra Shukana, Sarvashanda, Sarvabhadra Pashana, they chant a few mantras before they start Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva Maheshwara, Guru Shaksha, Parabaram, Tajmai, Shri Guru Vedamaha. And, it, and they do a few mantras here and there before the yoga classes, is often the case. Often it's not the case. But a, but a real yoga class, starts the class by honoring who it comes from. Not just the techniques, not just the asanas, not just the breathing exercises, but they're honoring the who. Not just the what, the why, the how, but they start the class by honoring the who. I have this experience a lot. There's a principle called uh, dakshin. At the end of a class, you offer a gift of money or goods to the teacher. This completes the cycle. The teacher has taken their time out to instruct you, and you need to reciprocate with a gift. You need to recognize that they are worthy of your time. Otherwise, again, why would you be there? And it's believed that if you don't give the teacher a doctrine, like if you come to a donation-based yoga class, and you don't give something at the end of the class, then whatever you've learned from the teacher is null and void. It's null and void. If you don't complete the cycle, the teacher is giving to you AC, but if you don't do the DC, if you don't do the return current of speaking nicely to the guru, honoring the guru, and giving the guru a gift, then whatever the guru has imparted to you is null and void. It's like 
sowing seeds in a barren land, trying to produce money from a magic wand, in the words of Arjuna. One has to honor one's teacher not only with suitable words, but also with a gift at the end. Now again in another area, the area of medicine. Ayurveda is a great field of medicine which derives from the Vedic scriptures, but it was brought when the ocean of milk was turned. One of the byproducts of the ocean milk was an avatar of Krishna, a partial expansion of Krishna called Danvantara. And Danvantara brought the knowledge of how to use every root, herb, and creeper and flower to cure diseases. And every living plant on the face of the earth has an ameliorative a palliative effect, if we only knew. In fact, even the prescription drugs are just chemical synthesis of plants and creepers and herbs that exist in nature. And so, similarly, to practice medicine, one should give all credit to Don Mantari, without whose appearance we would not have the science of Ayurveda. So yoga is wonderful. Medicine is wonderful. But as Vaishnavas, as personalists, we need to find the person within the message. We need to always ask and we need to recognize who it is I am listening to. And if that source is not worthy, it doesn't really even matter how good the content is, we're not going to bother listening. At best, it will not help. At worst, it will damage. Now, if you have a worthy source and that message is listened to with an open and not a critical, skeptical, jaded heart, you can still ask Hard questions. Arjuna asks a lot of sanyasyastu bahabaho, dukam yokam yoga yukta maram nachere anara gajati. Arjuna asks a lot of tough questions to Krishna, but he listens with an open heart. And as a result, after the 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita are poured into Arjuna, he comes to life. His senses are once again reawakened. He says, throw off this effort, apathy, throw off this ignorance, throw off this illusion. Now I'm firmly fixed and prepared to fight. If we bring this serious quality of hearing into our life, it's going to be the water that nourishes our soul, that feeds the creeper of bhakti. And as we hear, it will evolve into more than just taking sounds into the ear, beginning from hearing attentively, listening empathetically and personally, hearing will evolve into a full sensory experience. As we hear, it will engage not only our ears, but our tongue, our heart, our mind, our eyes, and even our sense of smell. Tashada vinda nayanasya para kinjaka talashiva antagata shravira shanksharam shakabhaitya tista tanhu such as in the case of the four Kumaras, who, after hearing about the Lord, smelled the aroma of musk and saffron from the lotus feet of the Lord and experienced a transcendental change of heart. And as we relish the process of hearing, it becomes a never-ending process. It's a well, a spring, that we go to again and again and never tire of. Growing up in Pennsylvania, in rural Pennsylvania, a small village named Stallstown, where they're probably... 200 people at most. Um, we would have as kids baseball clinics on Tuesday morning. It was a baseball field. Uh, no one knows how it got there. No one really knew as kids how it was maintained. But there was a nice field where we'd have our games and we'd have um, a fellow named Stan Partenheimer come down and give clinics on Tuesday morning. So we would all be at the field during our summer break from school, 8 o'clock in the morning. As the sun got up, and we were doing our drills, hitting, grounding, catching, running. We would get hot. We would start to perspire. So mid-morning, there was a break, and we would cross the road very carefully, go through the woods about maybe three-eighths of a mile to where there was a clear mountain stream, and a pipe had been inserted into this spring, and the most clear, pure, cold wonderfully tasting, refreshing water came from this little, maybe quarter-inch pipe. And we would line up, and we would just gulp and gulp and gulp and drink that water. To this day, it was 60, 70 years ago, to this day, I still remember the taste of that water. I'm not sure that ever since in my life did I ever taste water so good. 
when we line up and one after none and we taste it and then we get back in the back of the line and we go three or four times until our, our thirst was fully, fully quenched. So we wouldn't just do it once, but we'd wait and we'd go back again and again after certain intervals. And similarly, uh, hearing is not something just once and done in one ear and out another. If you hear in such a way as to nourish the creeper of bhakti, to nourish the spirit soul within your heart, you will not want to discontinue the hearing. It will continue not because we are allowed to do it, but it's because we want to do it. We don't want to stop it. To develop that ruchi is the highest perfection of life, that eagerness to hear more and more and more and more. Eventually, we'll stand before Lord Krishna, just like Maharaj Priku stood before him and tell him that two ears, two mouths, one, one set of tongue is not enough. Two ears, one mouth, one tongue is not enough to adequately hear about the glories of the Lord. Tun, uh, uh, Maharaj Prithu, he said uh, that uh, I don't have enough ears to adequately hear the messages of the Lord. I would like millions and millions of more ears. Similarly, Rupa Goswami said, Tunde Tanamini Ratim Bitana Tana Tanavali Divje Karna Kroda Kanamini Gitaya Te Karna Budish Priha. Give me millions and millions of ears so that I can hear about the glories of the Lord and millions and millions of tongues to repeat uh, those glories. Men are naturally apt to hear histories and narration of various personalities performing even mundane activities, but they don't know that that type of a hearing means they become addicted to the three modes of material nature and they waste the valuable time given to them in this human form of life. Rather, using that time to hear the transcendental histories and pastimes of the heroic Lord gives one an entirely different result. They may seem similar, similar conspiracies, similar types of betrayals, similar love affairs, similar types of battles, but they are totally dissimilar. Kama prema don hakara vivan loa hara hemi yachara shudaparam. Lust and love are both metals. They have that in common, but they are of different value. So the mundane narrations and histories and topics of this material world, they're like iron, and the topics of Krishna consciousness are like gold. Satam prashangam mabhiya sambito bhavanti yudhikana tajoshana dishu bhavagaratri shodha ratir bhatta mimi kashi. They reduce stress, they bring us freedom from anxiety, they clarify the purpose of life, they reveal who it is that we are and what we're put here and what is our purpose in life. They cleanse the heart from all misgivings and all unwanted things, gradually bringing the hearer, the attentive, active, empathetic hearer, gradually liberating that personality from mundane association, from the modes of material nature, and giving that ruchi, an irreversible, irrevocable taste for hearing more and more about the glories of the Lord. Narada Muni has explained how that has happened to him by his personal experience. He's chalked the way. He's blazed the path. We don't have to invent it. We don't have to do anything new. We don't have to be creative. We just have to follow the path that Narada Muni has trod, the path that the previous Acharyas have trod. Tarko pratishtam suti avaniya nashodi shirmatev dharmasya tadpam bhitam mahajeno yena gata sabanta. Simply by hearing after the way of the great Acharyas and teachers, by hearing about the Lord's transcendental pastimes, you can elevate yourself to become one of the associates of the Lord. Narada Muni, by attentive hearing, has now eternal life, unlimited knowledge, and unfathomed bliss. He can travel all over the material and spiritual worlds without any restriction. This is the great benediction of our current age of Kali, an age which otherwise has no spiritual attributes or assets. There is one great quality, Kale Doshe Nidhayarajan Asti Kirtan Yadiva Krishna Shyam Mukta Samgabara. In an age in which is, there is an ocean of faults, there is one brilliant quality, and that is that by hearing and chanting the holy names of the Lord, one can get freedom from material association and be transferred to the eternal 
spiritual world at the end of this life. Therefore, it is said in the Brihad Bhagavatiya Narada Puranchan, Brihad Bhagavatiya Puranam, Hari Rava Hari Nama Hari Nami Bakeram Kalo Nisteva 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 Gatira Jata Kali Kadera Dama Krishna Amasha Krishna Shakti Vinanaya Tare Pavartanam. The religious practice, the real yogi practice by which we reunite with God in loving devotional service in this age of Kali is chanting the holy names of the Lord. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. In this age of quarrel and hypocrisy, the only means of deliverance is chanting the holy name of the Lord. Kado nisteva nisteva nisteva. There is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other way. We don't need to be big philosophers. We don't need to be ascetics. We don't need to be the yogis. We just need to be attached to the great souls who have gone before us, follow in their footsteps and chant the holy names of the Lord. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made this abundantly clear in the assembly of sages in Varnaras, headed up by Prakasananda Saraswati. When Prakasananda Saraswati challenged Mahaprabhu, why do you not spend your time studying the Vedas, performing austerities, doing yoga, instead of chanting sentimentally in the street? Lord Chaitanya taught all of humankind by saying, Morikatumi Tomara Nahik Vedantikara Krishna Mantra Japasare Mantra. My spiritual master, First words out of his mouth are, my spiritual master, I'm taking my directions, I'm taking my signals from a qualified personality, not just anyone, not just from the content, but from the person from whom the content is coming. He, my source, told me that in this age, neither I nor anyone else has the qualifications to study Vedanta, study scripture, do austerities, do yoga, and come up with the right conclusion. He said the best thing that you can do in this age of Kali is Krishna Mantra Japa Shara and Mantra Shara. You're not qualified to study Vedanta, therefore you must always chant the names of Krishna. This is the essence of all Vedanta, contained within these three words, Hare Krishna Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Later on in the first canto, it says, Srinvatam Shra Kata Krishna Punya Saram Ridan Dashtuva Viduna Di Saritsatam. Just by the process of Srinvatam, hearing Shra Kata Krishna, as opposed to the mundane narrations of this material world, doing that, concentrating on that, doing it diligently, attentively, the result is punya shravanam kirtanam ridantashtubaran, everything that's inauspicious in the heart, everything that holds you back, that's contrary to devotional service, viduna tisaritsatam, is removed by your well wishing friend who himself accompanies you in the region of the heart. The messages of the Supreme Personality of God are non different from Him. When you open your heart, hearing from the right source, the Lord from within the heart becomes active. He's present there externally and internally. And bad, dirty things within the heart, lust, anger, greed, self-esteem, inflated self-esteem and ego, they don't have a chance. They don't have a chance. They are caught between the Lord externally and the Lord internally. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his Shiksha Stakam, eight prayers, glorifying the process of chanting the holy name, Says Nam Nama Kari Bahuda Nija Savisha Shisha Tapita Nimata Etadushi Tabakri Pambago Nidurdam Itishami Janin Ragaha. The name of the Lord has all of the potencies of the Lord. There is no hard and fast rules in chanting the names of the Lord. Everyone can chant. There's no rigid fixture of time, place, or circumstances. Anyone can chant the holy name of the Lord. The only condition is chant it seriously, chant it with attention. And chant it with reverence. The Lord, from His part, is so kind to us that He can be present before us personally in the form of sound. The Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Unfortunately, we have no taste for hearing and glorifying the Lord's name and activities. So, above all, beyond all, we have to prioritize. We have to make up and focus on that one glaring shortcoming on our part. We cannot listen carelessly. 
There's nothing about listening which is onerous, which is burdensome, which is unpleasant. It is all pure spiritual ecstasy and bliss. But we have to do our part and put in the effort with the idea of development and to taste or hearing and chanting the holy names of the Lord, uh, facilitating and catalyzing that by rendering service to the pure devotees at the same time. And then we'll be able to say with Narada Muni that our taste for hearing about the glories, name, fame, form, and pastimes of the Lord will increase at every step. Om Tat Sat. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We'll stop there. Wisdom, Motivational Monday, following the hills of a very successful Diwali festival last Saturday night. Thank you also for being with us here this Monday morning. Gene, who says, who says we just have to follow the path, Bhakti Gary, all glorious to Prabhupada, please accept my humble obeisances. <laughs> Anjali, Anjali, can we talk Thursday night? Can we have our monthly talk on Thursday night? Let me know, okay? I'll text you through pa Patreon as well. Anjali quotes us. She says, they didn't finish the race. They sat soaked and soured. <clears throat> Best move a little sideways so not obscuring Prabhupada's face just a couple of inches. A little late. I don't read the comments so much while I'm talking. The Garbo video is beautiful. Was looking for you an hour ago. Ah, daylight savings time. Ah, I understand. Rakesh, please cut my obeisances. Go in today, Brent. Rob, any takeaways from you? Uh, thank you, Prabhuji. Um, yeah, I guess to be discerning um, and to really pay attention to where this this wisdom is coming from. Um, Make sure that there's some that sampraday is there, not just listening to the speculation of people, um, and also searching your heart and making sure that you are listening from the right people. There, there is unlimited benefit. There is liberation from birth, death, disease, and old age. There's the gateway to the spiritual world is thrown open. All we have to do is just apply ourselves to the simple and blissful process of hearing, with diligence and attentiveness. That's all we have to do. We just have to do our little part. And Krishna will take us back home, back to God. So thank you once again, everybody, for being with us here on Motivational Monday. We'll be back tomorrow, Transcendental Tuesday. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram. Ram.